You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. All right. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. I'm very excited for today's episode. Well, the guest for this week was introduced from a past guest so that, well, one, I really enjoyed that because that means the last guest had such a great experience. And well, throughout today's episode, when you find out who this guest is, what he's accomplished, what he's working on right now, you're going to be impressed as well. With that, I'd like to introduce Richard Moran. Richard, thank you for being a guest this week on the Silicon Valley podcast. To start, can you give us a brief background of your career up until this point? And actually, could you let us know your thoughts of people's introductions while you're at it? Hi, Sean. It's great. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to give a, a, a summary of my background, but I am a big believer in shot clocks when it comes to introductions. How, how many of us have been in meetings to 40, you know, set the stage? It's a 45 minute meeting. There's six people in the room and the facilitator says, OK, let's go around the room and make introductions. And the first guy takes 20 minutes talking about how he played high school football and uh, how he worked at Intel in the early days. And then he lost his job, you know, blah, blah, blah. No one cares. So what I want to do is, you know, among many other things, is uh, alert people that what is important in an, in an introduction is what's relevant to the audience. So, so I'll give you a brief background. I was a partner at Accenture for many years. I loved that job. I was the CEO of Creative Solutions. I loved that job. I was a venture capitalist at Venrock. I loved that job. I was a college president. I loved that job. And that all adds up to, I have a checkered past. Maybe some people, maybe some of your listeners are saying, this guy can't keep a job, but um, I liked them all. I would almost say people are probably thinking he was too successful for any one job. <laughs> that's that's nice of you to say that. But, uh, you know, jobs run their course. And sometimes it's a, sort of a self-aware kind of person that needs to say, mm, it might be time for me to do something else and look for new adventures, whatever that might be. So I am that guy who recognizes that when a job runs its course, let's see what else is out there. So let's go back to that first job you mentioned, Accenture. Now, you were there for 15 years where most people last at these, these groups for two, maybe three years. Maybe you'll hear some go to five, but 15 is yeah. rather unique. In fact, I think you're almost a unicorn in that fashion. So could you tell us you know, how you lasted that long? Why, why was it then that it ran its course? Give us some information and some of the insights you took from that time there. Sure. Well, I think a lot of people abandon consulting, especially with the big firms, because there's so much travel involved, especially in the old days. I suspect now there's not nearly as much travel. But in those days, we were on airplanes all the time, visiting clients, working uh, to help them be successful. And I'll tell you, the, uh, the reason why I liked consulting so much was because there's a heroic element to consulting. If the client could figure it out, themselves, they would have done it. So the as a consultant, we would go in and help clients solve their problems and then and then leave with some understanding that the problem is was solved. And I, I liked that heroic element. And, and I also liked that. In fact, it instructed me as I've moved on in my career that I, I, there's sort of two kinds of consultants. Um, one is the, the consultant that yells at you. Oh, you should have done this. You should have done that. You know, you should have paid attention when the internet started. And that that's, I found that not to be so helpful. I was more of a listening consultant. I would spend a lot of time with employees, especially because they always know what's going on. So I'd listen to employees and then I'd give feedback to senior management and then clarify their options and, and move forward. So, so I, I actually liked it. It was hard. You know, it's hard on family. It's hard on it's hard on uh, it's hard on the body to to travel that much, but I think the large consulting firms have finally figured out that younger people don't want to travel like that, and and they want to balance more of a balance in their lives. But but I liked it, but it did like some so many other things I've done. It ran its course. What were some takeaways from that time there? Maybe experiences or lessons looking at a company that you could share with our audience. Sure. Uh, one, one lesson I learned was um, uh, perspective. And that was about a, a quick story. I remember 
we were organizing, reorganizing a, a major telco. And I was sitting in the, you know, I mean, one of the biggest ones in the world. And in order to reorganize it, a lot of people were going to lose their jobs. So the CEO and I were sitting in his office and they are literally burning his effigy in the parking lot. They're chanting. I thought it was like, like a vandals and Vitscots were going to storm the walls. And I looked at him and I said, doesn't all this bother you? And he said, well, it's unfortunate, but people will survive. And you know what? It's only dial tone. That classic quote, it's only dial tone stuck with me forever that, you know, work is work and, you know, you want people to be successful, but you need to maintain perspective about the corporate entity and and what that means. So perspective is one. And then the other thing that, that has stuck with me so much, and it relates to the book that we'll get to in a minute, is that um, what consultants often do is clarify what the options are. And sometimes leadership is saying, oh, I have so many options, I don't know what to do. And consultants often are good at saying, you know, uh, uh, Mr. or Ms. CEO, there's really only a few options here. So let's clarify what they are and let's pick one and move forward. And I think that has instructed me moving forward when it comes to uh, both leadership and decision making and and lots of other things. But I I liked consulting and I liked, uh, you know, there's also a, an element of, of uh, the variety. You know, in consulting, you can work with an airline in the morning and a high tech company in the afternoon and do homework on a, on a leisure, on a, a CPG company in the evening. So there, there's a lot of good things about consulting. And I, I think it also is a really good way for uh, young people to start their career because you may not enjoy it, but you will learn how to manage a project. And that's a skill that can come in handy, whether you're redecorating your house or reorganizing PG&E. Question right there, managing a project. Say there's a, a company that was founded right out of college. None of the founders, none of the team have ever really held down a career, a job. But now, you know, they're building a company. How would you recommend them getting the skill set to manage a project? Or do they are they just learning it as they go along? Well, most uh, I think most people do learn it as they go along and probably shouldn't. My my um, advice to project management is always start at the end. What what is the outcome of the project? Is it to reduce cost? Is it to launch a product? Is it to be profitable? What, what's what is the end that you have in mind on the project, and then work backwards from that and with thresholds in mind. My my experience is that sometimes, uh, especially well, it, it can be any any company, whether it's an early stage company or a big tech company, they overcomplicate projects. So there's spreadsheets with pivot tables and double inverted flux capacitors coming at you from from every direction and and. and you get you get lost in in the minutia of the project and uh, and I think if you start at the end, work backwards week by week and adjust accordingly that you'll you'll learn um, there's all kinds of programs and software to help you manage projects, but I think a lot of it is common sense and starting at the end and you'll find Sean everything I'm going to talk about so far is about common sense that you don't need to complicate things so much and we tend to do that i really like the double or flux time capacitor because i remember the back to the future scenes with marty oh, yeah. and <laughs> it, i'm not sure if you've ever heard the quote it was it's it stuck with me that uh people are worried about time travel because they'll do a little thing and affect the future so much but in today's presence they never think that that little thing could make a difference i was like oh yes. yeah that's that's a great quote We'll talk about that uh, uh, when we when we get to the book. But <laughs> use flux capacitors because everybody knows what that is. Everybody knows the term. No one knows what what a flux capacitor is except Marty and and Doc. You don't you don't draw it out in your book the little three <laughs> points and uh, the future, past, present, verge. Okay, okay, okay. Nerding out a little bit too much there. But let's go to your time as a venture capitalist. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are curious. 
how do venture capitalists actually look at deals and how do they do kind of their process step by step by step of having that meet in to write in a check? What was kind of yours and did you see it change over time? Yeah, well, I think every everybody, every single person who's in venture capital and every firm operates a little bit differently, but but operates with the same principle. And 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 that is just a simple again, simplicity, basic questions need to be answered. And this is what I always asked. Um, and even before I saw the 23 page deck, I would ask the the entrepreneur, I have two questions for you. One is what is it? Is it is it software? Is it a refrigerator? What what is it? And the second question was, how big can it be? And if, well, I, I was always surprised at how often an entrepreneur had trouble answering that first question, what is it? And sometimes, uh, you know, they wanted, they would want to go into the deck and talk about them, you know, the, the Gartner four quadrants and things. And I'd say, no, tell me, what is it? And they would often struggle with that. So if if an entrepreneur could not answer those two questions, then I'd say, well, you know, come back when you have good answers. I was always a guy, when I talked to entrepreneurs, I wanted to hear the story. What is the story? How did you get involved with this company? What is, what got you uh, so excited? I was, uh, uh, and still I'm involved in venture capital, and uh, I'm involved with a company that has developed a, a cure for periodont for gum disease. And uh, he developed technology because his dog had bad breath. And so he was telling the whole story that all, you know, basically all dogs have bad breath. So as a plastic surgeon, he developed a filler that worked in curing gum diseases in dogs. And lo and behold, it works in humans. So, so that's a story. That's a great story. And I want to hear stories like that because that can be a big, not only for dogs, but gum disease is, is pretty prominent. So, so I want to hear, I want to know what it is, how big can it be? What's the story? And then as I get excited about it, then there's all kinds of diligence and market sizing and all those kinds of things. But I think that um, you'll, all venture capitalists will want to hear a great, compelling story. And if, and that's, if I have one piece of advice for entrepreneurs and early stage uh, company founders, that is it, really develop your story. And it's hard. It's really difficult to do. Speaking of stories, I mean, your focus was social media, gaming, e-commerce, that. How is, I mean, social media is always in the news for good or bad. Yeah. But how have you seen it change since when you were at, at Venrock to, to currently and where do you see it going in the future? That's a great question, and I wish I, I knew the answer. Um, you know, the technology keeps on changing. The platforms keep, keeps on changing. Elon Musk keeps on throwing bombs into the whole ecosystem. I think that um, it is going to continue to, to uh, adopt, to adapt to what, what users want. TikTok is going to change. And the answer to your question is, that, you know, it, it, it's unsettled. Uh, you know, I think there's going to be new pop, new platforms that are secure. I think it might become verticalized more and more based on is is this about movie stars? Is this about music? Is this about tech? Um, and I think that's already happening a little bit. You know, my social media feed now includes everything, the Kardashians and and what's happening with uh, with AI, and and that, that's not necessarily what I want. So oh, the algorithm says that's what you want. So uh, Richard, when did you look at the Kardashians? I, I well, that's what everybody tells me. I've never, I don't, I've never watched the Kardashians. <laughs> I don't know the Kardashians, but somehow they are everywhere. So I, I guess I, I don't know the the algorithms. Life is an algorithm, and I wish it would stop entering uh, my my feed that way. But I, it's going to change, and it's and it's um, uh, scary. It's a little scary. Speaking of scary, before we get into your, to your book, but there is something in the book that says, you know, the five rules of an entrepreneur. Actually, I'll just hold this up for the audience right now. 
So this is Richard's new book, Never Never Say Whatever. Oh, the 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 green screen cuts it out. Highly recommend this. Read it over the weekend. Fantastic book. There's a part of it that says the five rules of entrepreneurship. One of those rules is do not run out of money. Now, right now, companies are facing challenges. It's in the news everywhere. Are there any tips from you know, the side of the venture capitalist table, the side of the Accenture, the, the consultant, what tips do you have for companies that might be facing this? Yeah. It, it's sort of like what my dad said he, when I went to college, he said, nothing good ever happens after midnight. And he was right, by the way. Nothing good happens if you run out of money. So if you're an early stage company, I, I can't emphasize, you know, you get, you're going to get a lot of advice, a lot of input. Do not run out of money. It puts you in a vulnerable position. It puts you, you just can't, don't do it. If you have to cut staff, if you have to reduce whatever it takes, my, my rule is, you know, do not run out of money. And a, a good venture capitalist, a good, a, good per, a good board of directors will help you figure out what that means. So it, it, there's lots of ways to do it. It could be loans. It could be going back for bridges. It could be could be lots of things. But rule number one: don't run out of money. Another rule, that, and I think it, it relates to the first one that, that I talk about, is um, beware the false sense of activity. When you're an early stage company, when you're a founder, or really any any leader, it's really easy to be busy. Any founder could go to a reception every night in the city where somebody's talking about what's happening in, you know, chat GPT or what's happening. There's a million things that any founder can do. So it's easy to fill up a schedule. It's easy to go to conferences. It's easy to, you know, spend spend time in, in things that are not going to be help you be successful. And and I see too many entrepreneurs filling up, you know, I look at their schedules and it's, you know, uh, it's like a, a Venn diagram. It's meeting on top of meeting on top of meeting. And I, I encourage founders to, to beware the false sense of activity. It's important to focus on what matters. With that, how important should kind of goals planning out the next few months be for, for companies and actually planning out those meetings, maybe plan out this much time's allocated to emails, this much time's allocated to the, this much time's allocated just to meditate and relax. I mean, how should people think about their calendar on a month by month basis? Yeah. I, I, well, I think people need to plan, you know, the first four chapters in any management 101 book is plan, lead, organize, and control. And, and I think right now plans are, uh, are, are written in sand and the wind is blowing, uh, based on, what's happening with banking and what's happening with the venture capital world. So I think any founder, anybody in, in Silicon Valley needs to, needs to plan accordingly. And I think you, you change your plan. So if your plan was to run out of money in uh, April and Silicon Valley Bank was your lender, then you need to do some replanning. So Planning is important. I think also downtime is is important for for anyone, and it could be whatever that means for pe some people. It's you know helicopter skiing. For others, it's it's meditating in in the backyard. But I planning, yes, plan, adopt your plans, uh, work with people to you know listen to pe what people are saying about planning. But I think what, one thing that's really important right now is to listen to what's going on in the in the ecosystem, you know, with banking and the venture world and competitors and in the M&A world. Well, you're in the M&A world, Sean, so you know what what things are happening, but you need to pay attention to what's going on. Some of the best um, advice I ever got when I started in venture capital was one of the partners at Venrock. Uh, who had been there for a while and was older, he said, um, you can't keep up on everything all the time, but I would suggest to you that every Sunday you read the New York Times from cover to cover. Don't just read the business section. Read the news. Look at the ads. Read the arts and leisure section. R read the real estate section. Read the New York Times from cover to cover every Sunday. 
and you'll be a better venture capitalist. And he was right. I've never heard that on the show. That's, I'm actually, I'll, I'll try that. I'll go online and, and see about getting New York Tech. Would the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg work? Or is it got, no? Get, no, get the hard copy of the New York Times. If you can find it, they're hard to find. Get, There's get it. libraries everywhere. What are you get talking it about? Delivered. Get it delivered, Sean. You, you're, you, you're a banker. You can afford it. Um, but it's important. I mean, just to, you get the gestalt of what's happening in the world every day. And, or for that week, and it's and it, and it and it becomes, especially for me since I was in media and entertainment, and uh, it really helped me understand what was happening and who was going where and what was happening in travel and leisure and the business section and banking. So, uh, if uh, your listeners take nothing away from this podcast, let it let it be known that I'm hoping that they'll subscribe to the New York to the New York Times on Sunday. Later on, we're going to find out you're a fifty percent owner of the of the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, but I like the newspaper. From your experience and time in Silicon Valley, what are your thoughts, kind of a potential repercussions with SVB Bank? How that's going to affect the startup world, the venture world? Is everything going to be okay in a, in a week or two, or do you think we're going to? This is the first ripple. Do you think there's these things people haven't thought of? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, this will date myself, but I started my career in Silicon Valley at Atari. And, you know, if you have that Atari set in your garage, keep it. It's a collector's item now. So since that time, I have heard of the demise of Silicon Valley three or four different times. And every time it came back, uh, uh, shaped a little bit differently. The focus might be a little bit different. And I think that will happen again this time. I think that there's just too much going on here. There's too many smart people, too many institutions, too many, too many uh, people who are so excited about the future. So what I'm hearing is that AI, artificial, you know, in all of its different configurations, is going to be the basis of the new Silicon Valley as it forms, because that's going to affect. The workplace is going to affect manufacturing. It's going to affect everything. And I think um, it is only starting to have that impact now. But as I listen to smart people in the Valley who are talking about the next, the reincarnation of the Valley, they're talking about AI. And they're putting it in the same context as the Internet. Just as the Internet changed Silicon Valley, AI will change Silicon Valley again. And I hope that's the case. Interesting, interesting. And... Going back to the idea of companies running out of funding, the topic that's coming up quite a bit is where can I get a bridge loan? Where can I raise mezzanine around? What are some suggestions for companies maybe when they're, they're thinking, guys, if I just had this extra money to extend things another six months, eight months, or whatever. Are there any tips or tricks or suggestions for when they go back to their existing investors, their current board, or whoever they're trying to get this money from mm -hmm. well the best place to to find new and to find to get money is always your existing investors because they've already sunk some money in and they don't want to lose it so existing you always go back to existing investors first i am uh, as we speak i am uh fielding calls from other banks not necessarily located here in silicon valley who want who want to replace uh, what Silicon Valley Bank did, and I'm not going to name them, but they're from all over the all over the world, actually, who are trying to fill that void, and they might fill it in a little bit of a different way, but I think that some of those new banks that are entering the the uh, uh, the scene here are the ones that might be a, a good spot for those for those bridge loans. I would also get some advice. I mean, Silicon Valley Bank people are still around, and they're great. I mean, I. You know, these are not devil, you know, they're, they didn't emerge from hell and say, oh, we're going to blow up Silicon Valley. There were some, there are still great people affiliated with the banks roaming around the valley. And I think, I think some of those are good people to get advice from. And they might, you know, be able to refer you to, to other lenders, other family offices, other banks. But, but it's a little confusing right now. It's a, you know, that, 
when you drive to Lake Tahoe on Route 80, those flashing signs that say weather ahead unsettled, it always it it always makes my blood pressure go up. Um, and that's sort of what we have right now, weather ahead unsettled. But that's, yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, many times you'll hear of so many companies when they fail, the engineers, the teams, they they spin out and do other companies and you know, this one company failure brings 50 new ones. I wonder if something like that's going to happen with Silicon Valley Bank, where all these bankers that were there drive innovation other places. It could be. Yeah. Smart people committed to the Valley uh, have special skills related to technology and, and venture capital. They're not, they're not dying. They're going to, you know, new, either new banks will be formed. Remember, Silicon Valley Bank was formed with not a lot of money, but really focused on uh, on the unique requirements of what early stage companies required and those skills are still there at within people that are what i don't know what's going to happen with silicon valley bank but that somebody will fill that void some bank or some group will fill that void and that's good i'm an optimist i think everyone in silicon valley is an optimist i mean if you weren't how could you do a startup i know, I know. you're right we're, we're foolish. Some people would say that's foolish, not optimistic. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah. <laughs> and, and with that, also, before diving in the book, you're also president of a college. Mm -hmm. How do you think the current school system is preparing entrepreneurs? Is there anything that you would change that from your experience in the school system to get people ready for maybe this new world of AI that's that's upon us? Yeah, possibly upon us. Yeah. The answer is. And I'm a, I'm a, an evangelist for this also that a lot of the soft skills are just not taught in high school or college at all. For example, um, you you can study calculus for three years. Uh, I didn't, but lots of people do. And um, but there's no classes usually in decision making. No one in high school. No one teaches decision making. No one teaches financial management. Personal financial management. It's hard to get those kinds of classes. So, you know, the, the number one uh, changes from year to year, the number one um, uh, major in colleges is accounting, which I think might be a sign of the apocalypse that's coming, uh, or computer science. And those are all going to change with AI and, uh, and coding. You know, people, are, people learned coding in the fourth grade. Coding might go away because of AI. So I, I think that colleges are and high schools are are slow to change, and that's just by their nature. And I think they need they need to pay attention to what's going on. Maybe they need to start reading the New York Times from cover to cover as well. well I'm just wondering when they get it if it's going to be a, a physical print or a virtual reality world where you're just <laughs> scrolling through through the well, pages. You know, and and I think you know you whatever. You know, all, every basically every college class that can be taught at any college in the in the country in the world, you can get online for free. So why? So what's the value of, of the college? Is it you know the de developing the soft skills and relationships? And yes, that that is it. Because why spend all that money? I saw that they're about to. Some colleges are about to break the hundred thousand dollar a year mark. That's a lot of money. Or something that you can get for free online. It, it's incredible. I mean, piggyback on that a little bit. How many people you hear doing a 15 week boot camp for coding and being more hireable than someone with a PhD in a in a major field that you know may not be yeah. that desired in the job market? It's it's crazy. Yeah. I know it's it. Yeah. So uh, that that well the and the trade schools, of course. But, you know, are starting to reemerge because it might be more fun and interesting to be a uh, a carpenter or a welder than a, an out of work PhD in garbology or or something. I mean, that was my favorite class in college, garbology. <laughs> Richard, now I mean, we've gotten a lot of your history. I want to dive into your book first off. I mean, I think just by looking at the cover, never say whatever. What is the word whatever? What does that what does that saying really mean? Yeah, it's a word I hate. Um, well, it means two things. And they're um to start with, 
um, when when I hear the word whatever, it it it, it immediately. I may, I make I probably shouldn't, but I look at that person. I make a judgment, a little bit of a judgment, and I look carefully. Is and I wonder, is this a slacker or is this somebody who's just filling that space? And the other the other uh, thing that whatever can mean is that somebody's not making a decision, and it's the whole book is about how small decisions matter. But you know, Sean, if you listen to people who, who say whatever, and I'm not a, I'm not an actor. But when they say whatever, some people can say whatever, which means I don't care. Uh, that, you know, they can be a little bit more emphatic, like whatever, which means I hate you. Uh, you know, the word has just so many uses, but they're all bad. They're all bad. So I am trying to uh, stop people from saying that word. As simple as that. The whole, uh, the whole book is in the cover. Never say whatever. Okay. Now with whatever. There's a lot of whatever questions in the book. Can you give our audience some examples of what a whatever question is? Yeah, well, it's a it's a simple test. It can be simple as, um, you know, I I I tell the story of you go into the break room when we used to go into the offices, and there's a big sign on the cupboard that says the maid no maids work here. Clean up after yourself. And there in the sink is a pile of dirty dishes. So you say, ah, whatever, I'm just going to do this and add to the top. Well, no, you shouldn't do that. Or should I prepare for a, for a meeting, even if it's on Zoom? Whatever, you know, maybe not. Or should I prepare for a, uh, my performance review? Whatever, and, you know, I can slack off on that. So there's just a million decisions, starting with, uh, I've seen this with, with children, and I used to do it myself. You wake up in the morning. You say, Ugh, I don't feel like working today, whatever. And and you start off your day with a whatever attitude and it never gets better. So you shouldn't do that. There's all kinds of questions that that you should, you know, ask yourself. And the answer is not whatever. So I like I like to remind people that there are simple questions to ask yourself. With work, by the way, I worked with someone who's very intuitive. And she said that when she hears the word, when, when she talks to someone and she hears the word, whatever in response, she stops and says, tell me what that means. And it, it's a really good signal that causes people to say, you know, maybe I meant uh, something that I didn't intend there. And, and the story I like to tell also, one, one last story here about the word. Uh, some researchers at Cornell have done some analysis and that they found that in the simple act of going out to lunch, you make about 200 decisions. Where to go? Where to sit? Is it warm enough? Is it cold enough? You know, sourdough, whole wheat, white, lettuce and tomato, mustard, mayonnaise. And every time you say the word whatever, which basically means you didn't make a decision, you're likely to get what you don't want. You're likely to get mayonnaise on a sandwich that you didn't want. You're like, and so it's just a good example of when you say whatever or don't make a decision, the chances of you getting what you want diminish every time. Speaking of getting whatever you want, in the book, it also talks about good enough. Is it, well, my question is startups, sometimes they think good enough is correct when they have to move fast and pivot, but where is that line of Good enough. When should things move forward? Yeah, good enough. You know, sometimes whatever. It, it, when someone says whatever, they're really saying oh, that's good enough. And it, it maybe it is, but probably not. And I, we find as I did a lot of interviews for the book, I found that one of the things that happens in really large organizations is that attitude of whatever because it's good enough. Nobody will, it doesn't matter. Whatever, it doesn't matter. A startup should never have that attitude. In the early stages, you know, good enough is, you know, probably not, when it comes to the product or when it comes to the processes or when it comes to people, good enough is never, uh, is never appropriate. And uh, I tell the story in the book, as a venture capitalist, I interviewed, uh, we were looking for a CEO of a startup 
And we thought we had somebody. He was, he was sort of good. He was good enough. But then I found somebody who was great. And it, and it immediately showed me that good enough and saying whatever, let's move forward, was, was going to be the demise of the company. So we stopped and moved forward with the, with the alternate uh, CEO who made the company great. Speaking about decisions, how is the core or what is the correlation between success and the speed of making a decision? There's a lot of research that talks about how speedy decisions are, are better. Bain did a whole, whole bunch of studies on that, and they found that speedy decisions are better, probably because you don't waste time, because lots of times that first decision that you're going to make was, was the good one anyway. So I'm not suggesting that when it comes to you know taking a big new job and moving to a new location or changing careers or where you go to school or those should not be made in two minutes. But often your gut is telling you the right decision. You may not like what that correct decision is, but you know what you should do in your heart of hearts. And, and so there's a two, there are a lot of researchers call it the two minute rule. The decision that you were likely to make in those first two minutes is probably the best one. And if you wait for a week, then you've lost time and you're still making that decision that you could have made in the first two minutes. So I think that um, for early stage companies or college presidents, I think that the, the, the process is very simple. It's, you know, you listened to people, you looked at the data, you looked at the options, and then you said, here's what we're going to do. And that's simple as that. Again, simple, but it often doesn't play out that way. If a company early stage, later, has a whatever kind of business culture, is it possible to change that? Or once you have this whatever, 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 sorry to say it three times, I know your ears are bleeding. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the whatever ghost just appeared. But is there any way to change that? To, uh, yeah. Well, move it in another know, direction. One of the things I, to your, to your, to, you know, three Pete there, um, the word is like, is like an earwig. It's like an earworm. All of your listeners now are going to hear the word, whatever. And they're going to say, Oh man, what, I shouldn't say that. What's, what's happening here. Um, so I don't make any apologies for that. I want you to, when you hear it, that when you hear that earwig, ear, earworm talking to you, you should stop and say, "What do I mean?" Um, but in an, in a culture that's about whatever needs, can can change by by leadership and by setting new rules and by laying out options. And I talk about um, remember uh, uh, Zenefits when they were in the early stage. You know they they were having uh, behavior problems. You know, they were having, you know, beer, beer was being served in the morning and, you know, employees were having sex in the stairwells and, and somebody was saying, whatever, we'll allow a culture of, you know, whatever is required. And that, that backfired on the company. And I think somebody, you know, laid out some rules. Zenefits is, is successful now because they laid out the rules to say, here's how we're going to make decisions in this company. And that is no longer whatever is not part of that. So I, I applaud organizations that have rules and about how we're going to make decisions. And uh, those, are the, those are usually the successful ones. Wait, Richard, another question for you. I mean, we were just talking about kind of that strong leader. Could you give an example or tell us a little bit about maybe a decision-making process that an organization could respect and support. Yeah. Um, especially from my consulting days, the successful leaders were the ones that uh, were able to identify the options and, and pick one, even if it wasn't a popular one. And I think lots of times, especially leaders have to make decisions that are not, are not popular, but they, but they do it anyway. And I think early stage companies, you know, are faced sometimes with, well, we're, if we're going to run out of money, I have a choice. I can either let this group go or, or reduce, reduce the staff 
or put the timeline out there for the product introduction to be longer. I mean, and none of, none of the options are good. So sometimes you have to make a decision when, uh, when none of the options are good. And that's the sign of a good leader. Because if, when a leader says whatever regarding those decisions, he's, he or she is just delaying what's, what's inevitable. And sometimes in consulting, this would happen all the time, where the consultants would make recommendations and then lead into the decision. And then consultants would get blamed. For whatever that decision was, and that was okay. But a successful leader is not afraid to make decisions. And even in the valley, uh, you know, Steve Jobs made Steve Jobs never said whatever. Larry Larry Ellison does not say whatever. I hope I don't think he does. And when you look at the successful people, they they don't say that word. They make decisions, and it can be based on their gut. Yeah, or it can be based on analysis, but they make decisions. One more question before wrapping it up. What happens if you're placed in that situation where it's you make the decision for me so later I can blame you? If that comes up, how should you respond? Yeah, that that's the that's the worst of all possible worlds. I think that um, when the options are laid out, then you share the decision making, but that that is often the case. Yeah, that can be true in personal relationships. It can be true in uh, in business. It can be true in startup. But lots of times, when I mean, it can be as simple as this, Sean. It can be as simple as what do you want for dinner? I don't know, whatever. And then something is served that you don't like, and you blame the person who made the decision. So it, it's. It's the worst of all possible worlds. So it's the the theme with, that I'm so emphatic that I'm trying to get across is the small decisions can be the ones that matter in your life and in your career because there's not very many big decisions. So make the small ones. And every time you say whatever, you're not making a decision. And with that, Richard, if there's any last takeaways you want to give our audience, or if you want to let them know where they can find your book, what's the best way to find out more about what you're working on? It's your time to, to wrap up the show. Sure. For everyone out there, Richard's on the radio or has a long career, so he knows how to do the wrap up. Uh, yeah, well, uh, should, I can do my radio show uh, final final note. Um, but uh, the book is available. It's out. You can get it on on any of the usual places: Amazon, Barnes and Noble, local bookstores. Um, and I and I hope that it resonates with with everyone. Uh, so I also have a website, and I'm my check on that. I'm big on LinkedIn. I try to get things going on LinkedIn all the time. Richard, what's the website's URL? It's richardmoran.com. Easy as simple. Uh, and 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 my radio show on CBS, I, I enjoy doing that. Every week I talk about whatever's on my mind, like should you take your dog to her or things like that. So uh, so I'll, I'll close off, Sean, with my radio closing. And that is in the workplace. This is Rich Moran. Fantastic. And for our audience out there, we're going to have all that information in the show notes. And when I'm not the host of the Silicon Valley podcast, I'm a mid-market investment banker focused on mergers, acquisitions, growth capital, secondaries. Please reach out to me, connect with me on LinkedIn or the Silicon Valley podcast.com where you can see our episodes, show notes, show notes, everything that we're working on. And well, more than anything, I want to thank our audience for listening. And Richard, I really want to thank you for taking the time this week's episode of the Silicon Valley podcast.